Oh, you did a great job with the book. It's great. I, I, you know, and you probably get this all the time, but the accent is obviously a, a real key. That works, does it? Is it okay? Oh, it, it, yeah, the, the accent is really a, a, an asset. Did I sound like I knew what I was talking about? Yes, it, sound, <laughs> yeah, it sounds smarter. Yeah, believe it or not, to, 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 to Americans and uh, people in, in other places, that, that, that accent is, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, I guess, an element of um, authority that comes with it almost. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't get that here. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 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 I, I say that I have I have done so, a lot of British books that are nonfiction, and uh, they seem to work out fine. So they must they must like the way yeah. I sound. Imagine waking up, and you've lost your smile. This happens. It's a condition called Bell's palsy, which I'd never heard of, until I worked with William K. Lawrence turning his excellent book, The Bell's Book, which is all about this, it happened to him, into an audio book. And it turns out that this is the only audio book in the world about this condition. He's a great guy. He's had an amazing life. Moved all around the United States. And I really got on well with him. This was the first time we'd actually spoken. We'd, when we were doing the book together, it was all messages. Uh, text messages through ACX and emails. But this was the first time I got to actually sit down and chat to him for a while and talk about his experience of having Bell's palsy and what he discovered about the condition and the process of writing the book and then turning it into an audio book. Now, keep listening because at the end of this video, I'll tell you how you can get the audio book, the Bell's book, for free. This is my chat with William K. Lawrence. Bill, the, the Bell's Book, an essential guide to Bell's palsy and how to take back your smile. We should start then with what is Bell's palsy? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very rare uh, d disease that, that strikes uh, a small number of people. Not a lot of people get it out of, out of the world population. Uh, really only a little less than 2 million a year are estimated to get Bell's palsy. If you think about it in this way, I mean, that's about 5,000, 6,000 people that will wake up every day across the globe without a smile. And so that it's, it's a little number, but it's, but it's a lot. And, uh, and, and what it is, it's, it's a very mysterious thing. It, it, it's a uh, disease that strikes the seventh cranial nerve and which is the nerve that comes in from your uh it's right around where your ear meets your cheek and it strikes uh, something uh they think it's viral and they think that virus strikes the nerve there and once you have any kind of nerve damage to that seventh cranial or any of your cranial nerves uh that affects all the muscles and you, you really can't move uh any of those you have 43 muscles in your face and it, it's like cutting that and it's like cutting a wire uh, that and 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 the problem is it's very mysterious. Other than the viral theory, they don't know really what causes it. Uh, the, they they don't really they haven't even been able to isolate the virus in in a lab a setting with patients. So when it when it when it strikes somebody, they have no idea that it's coming. They wake up in the morning. This is something you wake up in the morning with, and you you don't you. I didn't realize at first when I woke up. It, it took me a little while. Uh, I was eating breakfast, and that and that's kind of where I, where I felt, well, wow, this is a little, feeling a little funny. The food's leaking out of my mouth a bit, and uh, I went to go look in the mirror, and there it was. And uh, it it really affects your, uh, you know, your, your entire side of the side of the face that's affected is is visibly uh, impacted by that. A lot of people have will have a severe uh, droop and that side of the face just drops. There's no muscle control whatsoever and it's just complete par paralysis. And and so I, I realized that it, it, the first thing that comes to mind is, is, this a, is this a stroke? Exactly, that's the first thing. You're gonna think, oh my God, I've had a stroke. Because Bell, yeah. Bell's palsy, I've got to admit, I'd not heard of it before until we did the audiobook together. 
Yeah, and, and I, I had neither. Uh, this was a this was a complete surprise. I had only known one person uh, that I encountered professionally along the way that I I had uh, vaguely heard uh, th that they had had it, and uh, I didn't know anything about it. And uh, I actually I, I take that back. Uh, my uh, I had my brother-in-law who actually came down with it about a year before I did, about a year, year and a half. And so that that's a very odd uh, odd coincidence there that we both happen to get the same uh, disease. But it is purely uh, that, just a coincidence. Disease. What's that? It is just a coincidence, though. It is. It is. We live in different cities. Uh, we weren't around each other. Uh, there, there has been through the years. There, there have been some theories out, and that's the thing with this. There are a lot of theories and myths that go around this disease. Uh, one, one belief was that. Uh, that this could spread, that you could actually spread this through the air, uh, the, the, like like any kind of virus. Uh, and they, in I think it was Peru, where they uh, they found an office building where a number of people uh, all came down with Bell's palsy right around the same time. It, it wasn't a significant number of people; it was three or four, I think, at the most. But it was enough to to sound the alarm. But then it's never happened. Ever. I, I, I've come across no other evidence that that's ever happened. Uh, so they just don't really know. Um, they, the viral theory is the best thing they have to go on. And they think, uh, yet they haven't been able to isolate the virus in, in that setting. Um, one study that, that was done in Brazil uh, had, took 171 people who had Bell's palsy and they were only able to uh, get two, two of those participants, they were able to find the virus in their saliva. So that's, that's not a significant number. That, that's uh, very few people that uh, out of that big number, 171, that they could even trace. So they traced uh, a virus, but they haven't even found a direct link between the, what they found in the saliva and this damage to the nerve. Well, that's what it is. They, 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 can't, they can't isolate it enough to say that this is definitely the cause of the nerve damage. Um, they think that uh, the, the virus that gets in there is uh, herpes zoster virus, uh, which everybody has a little bit of that in them. Uh, if you get a cold sore, uh, it's not the sexually transmitted kissing type of herpes. Uh, it's the uh, it, it's one that a, a lot of us have anyway. And if you've had chicken pox like I had when I was a, a, a teenager, you 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 would also have that in your system. It's it's in there. It never really comes out. And the theory is that it, it does suddenly come out and strike, you know, these occasional people who come down with Bell's palsy. So it's a. Uh, that, that's the theory that it suddenly comes alive and it happens to be there and strikes that nerve. And there's no other virus, there's no other cause that, that doctors and scientists have come up with that links the, the Bell's palsy cause. So it's quite mysterious. And you did have a theory that you mentioned in the book, but you, you largely discount it. But can you talk us through that? Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, the night before I was shaving in the mirror and I was stretching my mouth and, uh, I felt a, I felt a, a tug and I said, it felt like a, a kind of muscle pull. And I said, that's a very strange, uh, feeling to feel like you've pulled a muscle in your face. You feel it in your arm or your leg if you're running, but this was, you know, in my face and, uh, it was very unusual. I had never felt anything like it at all. And it, it, it kind of, it, the, the, that, sh that slight pain passed, it subsided after a little while. Uh, I went to bed that night and all was fine, really. It had passed a couple of little um, spasms in my cheek after that. So I didn't really think much of, 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 the, of that incident. I went to sleep and this was uh, January 2019, and I woke up uh, the next morning, and and that was it. And uh, so that was my theory uh, going into the doctor. What, that it was shaving I related? I, was, you, I hurt myself pull, shaving. You pulled a muscle shaving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
So it's strange it comes on in the night, isn't it? It was, I, I really enjoyed doing your book. And I must admit, when I when I first auditioned for it, I thought, okay, this is, this is going to be like a heavily medical book. But I loved the way it was so autobiographical and you shared so much of your life. And it was so well written as well, because you clearly have experience in that area. You weren't a, a novice at this, at, at sharing. What made you sit down and go, yeah, this is a book? I think as I as I wanted to learn about this disease myself, uh, I I think the first thing everybody's going to do is go right to Google and start. This is what we do these days. We try to self-diagnose and we try to find out what it is. Uh, because I had heard uh, of of Bell's uh, vaguely, uh, I I I knew that that this was a possibility. But I also worried about a stroke, obviously. And so so, so can I just back up a little bit? Because that's quite serious if somebody, I mean, someone could literally watch this and wake up tomorrow with it. I mean, it's a long shot, but, but it could happen. How do sure. you make sure that it's not a stroke? How, how I knew, um, well, I, I went several hours and I, I was still alive. So I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky, but, uh, but really, uh, I, I, I also kind of knew that because if it if it's a stroke, you you'll have that feeling of paralysis down that that same side of the body, all the way down. All the way down, it more than just the face. It won't just be the face. This was just from the forehead uh, to about the the jawline. If it's at any lower than that, and I say on page one of the book, if it's any lower than that, if you're feeling anything in your arm or your leg, you got to go to you got to go right to the hospital. You got to call somebody, uh, and it you know in and that's the other thing. Very few people reading that book at that point uh, that come across that or uh, even that message that I put out there will not even be able to read it if they're having a stroke. Right. OK. So you, okay. you will know. You will it's definitely a big, it's know. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. Yeah. yeah so so getting hard. getting back to the decision to write the book, I just wanted to get that out there because that's quite important. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I so I as I started to investigate the, the issue, I. I realized that there were a lot of websites out there, some credible, some not so credible, uh, you know, dot com sites. Uh, so I found uh, dug into a lot of medical websites, but I found that a lot of the information was scattered across the web. There were very few books written about the subject at all, going back decades, centuries, even very little. Um, and as a researcher and educator, I have access to um, databases at work. So I, I went right into the medical. I have access to really good medical databases and all the scholarly journals. And I got right in there, and there was a, there was a lot of uh, information in there that, that a lot of people can't access from the free web. And so uh, I realized, wow, this is, this is a lot of uh, – and some of that's some heavy-duty medical terminology that I had to weed through. So I thought, you know, there's all these different sources out there. They're spread out. Uh, how how easy would it be to to you know to put this together for somebody and uh, help someone else out who's not going to have that same access that I have to the databases that may not have the time to go through all those websites. And there's you know there's a lot of repetitive information that you see across all the sites. And then there's a lot of uh, myth too, as I mentioned. A lot of mythology that that kind of goes out there and beliefs about this that um, misinformation really. Um, so I wanted to uh, really uh, put together a solid uh, little just hand little handbook to help people uh, get through this, and and so it just kind of evolved that way. It started with that later chapter, which was my my own personal narrative. And then I thought, let's uh, let's gr let's grow this and uh, have a chapter that kind of deals with the history of it and, and then have a chapter that deals with uh, kind of my own treatment of it, what I went through to um, to help myself through this this period. And what's the response been like to the to the book? Uh, very well. It's, uh, it's 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 been my most received uh, book so far. Great. Surprise. Yeah, it's uh, so. I, and and globally, I think people from around the world are uh, looking at this, and uh, I, I I connect with a new person or two uh, every day on social media who uh, ha has come down with Bell's palsy, and they're distraught over 
uh, the situation. I think that that's the biggest thing to know about this is that it's once you realize that this is not a stroke and it's uh, not anything else, uh, it's just Bell's palsy. It's not physically, uh, it's not a physical danger. Uh, so it, it's really all emotional. It's a, this is a, a, a mental battle that you have to get through. And that, and that can be tough on a lot of people. That, that it's, it's very, uh, you don't realize how important a smile is and, and any facial expression for that matter. The, the psychological um, part of this is, is the real challenge. And how many languages has the book been translated into? Uh, so far, H Hindi and Chinese have I just I saw come those out. on Amazon. Yeah, and, I saw uh, those on there. Yeah, and uh, French is also underway. Uh, Italian, uh, Portuguese also is being worked on. And uh, Spanish, I'm looking forward to Spanish as well. So to get this out into other languages, I think, would be great because it, it happens all over the world. It's, it's um, like I mentioned, it's about five to 6,000 people every day will wake up tomorrow morning without a smile. And just uh, and that and that's that's a lot of people that uh, they have no idea how to get the help with that. There are some countries that don't have uh, really good reporting on this, so uh, or treatment for that matter. So they might have a lot of people that don't even get treated for it. Um, but in in most places, it's it's uh, well reported, and uh, the the steroid treatment is the first uh, the urgent thing. You got to get that within a a couple of days otherwise it really defers uh, the, the the healing process but uh, the medical profession are aware of it enough to know exactly what to do so you've got to get help straight away yes yeah you have to go you have to go to see your uh, your practitioner um, it, it's again it's not an emergency situation unless you you're feeling that numbness down your body but um, you got to get right into that doctor uh, we, really within 48 hours to get the steroids going. Um, there's, they'll also give an antiviral drug, um, but the uh, the research studies are kind of mixed on the results of both of those together. Um, but the steroid has been shown to uh, definitely help and in, in, improve, uh, speed up the, the recovery. And in most cases, people make a, a, a really good recovery, not always 100%, but they make a good recovery. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. Uh, the, there are I read about one one uh, gentleman. He was a uh, a news reporter. So this is devastating for him to go on the news. TV. Uh, wow. He, yeah, TV. So there's just no. He was. That's it. My my whole career is at stake. And he uh, they wrote a little news article and 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 posted this on. Uh, on the internet about him and at the end you find out that he's back to work after a couple of weeks and <laughs> and he's one of those lucky ones uh, but most most will heal up within uh there's there's a uh, two or three weeks the, a good number fall into that category and another uh category kind of fall into the two to three month range and then there are the uh five to ten percent that uh, have really lasting effects. Um, there's a very small percentage who really never get back their their facial uh, movement. Very small, probably probably about one to two percent um, that uh, visibly have the the lasting effects. Uh, I think I, I fall kind of within the ten percent of of people who have lasting remnants of, of this. Uh, I'm not sure that anyone who gets this feels 100% better coming out of this ever, uh, but uh, that's well, the research is still out on that. Uh, but there's a, there's a number of people who have these kinds of uh, remnants of it where it's just a, a tightness in the face or uh, for the longest time, if I smiled too uh, big or laughed too hard, I we get a Charlie horse uh, muscle cramp and it would just rip right up my jaw. And uh, it was very painful. So I, I got into the habit of regulating my smile and being just really being wow. conscious of it because, and this, this was a year, year and a half after, uh, you know, having this. So I, I was able to almost fully smile. Uh, I'm still not a hundred percent able to, uh, there's still that lasting effect. So, but the Charlie horses have gotten better. I don't know if that's because I've just been managing it uh, a little bit better. And why did you decide to make the book into an audio book? 
That was uh, recommended because I, I think there's a good there's a good population out there that um, that listen to listen to books now, and that that's a whole other um, you know I think a whole other field of people that I could reach. So whatever way I could reach them, if it's through audio, if it's through ebook, uh, paperback, uh, whatever way I could get that message out to people, I've posted some uh, samples, free samples out on the web. Um, so I, I thought these were just some different ways to reach people. Somebody actually recommended it. They actually, uh, they had one person ask, is this available on audio yet? Yeah, let me know when it is. So <laughs> got right on that. So I'm have you turned, I, I know, I know you're a writer. Have you turned any of your other books into audio books yet? I have not. This is, this is my very first. Uh, well, there'll be a few people. I mean, this is, this is mainly for people who are thinking of reading a good book and you know people who want to find out more about Bell's palsy maybe someone in their family's been affected or maybe they just want to read about it and so they know what to do and they don't freak out so much if it happens because it can happen to anyone but there might be a few people watching this who are authors and who are thinking of converting one of their books into an audio book how was the experience for you as a first time audio book um producer i suppose you'd call it or, or, yeah. <laughs> or author that's that's become an audio book um or one of their books turned into an audio book how was the experience for you oh it was uh well it was a pleasure working with you of course <laughs> uh, you're easy to work with so uh, <laughs> it was a, it, it was a good book actually i have to say you know i only started doing audio books in may you know after lockdown and uh i've done 31 books since may but wow. every every one of them has been wonderful just a wonderful experience I've, I, they've either been fiction and they've been good stories or the non-fiction ones i've learned about marketing and uh, uh, financial freedom and, and bell's palsy which i'd never heard of before and you know some people you know have a goal of reading one book a month well you know i've done 31 since may it's been you know in about three years time i'm going to know everything about everything it, it, but yours was really really good to do and i must admit when i first saw the okay medical thing you know but yeah, you know, to learn about you and your and and your story was great. Yeah, yeah, I really tried to simplify it to uh, to to make it accessible to a lot of people because I, you know, as I as I looked in, into the medical journals, you find that uh, a, a lot of that's just not accessible. Uh, even getting to the, the the article itself is difficult, but once you get it, how do you make sense of it? So there was a lot to go through and learn and. Uh, so I, I really did try to uh, to, to make this uh, as accessible as possible for the for the average person, and uh, and and I realize it's definitely a niche book. It's not something that most people are going to be yes excited. Let's get the Bell's book. And I'm very <laughs> excited to get into this uh, good read. It is something that uh, it's it's a guidebook. It's to help people and and their families and friends. People, as you mentioned, um, a lot of people will read this and they'll. Uh, get really a better understanding of what their loved one's going through. Uh, because as I, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a very uh, emotionally and psychologically taxing uh, disease that, that most people will get through, but uh, it, it results in a lot of social anxiety and, and other uh, emotional issues. So, And the process of turning your book into an audio book, did you find that was, uh, it took longer or it was quicker than you thought? Uh, it was a lot quicker, actually. Oh, was it? Uh, How long did it take yeah, us in the end? It was a lot quicker. Uh, I think there was a little bit of wait after you recorded. and Yeah, uh, that's the ACX go through, it. through the process and they check the yeah. audio out and all. They, they don't trust me by now. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. well, how long did it take us? It was it's, it, a couple of weeks, I, was it? I think it was uh, maybe a few weeks from the beginning of uh, to, to the time you, you, you wrapped it up pretty quickly. And, I, and uh, this is a short book, so this is, a, uh, I think, without having to read um, the visuals, that was something we had to think about. Um, right. So but, you did have to re you did have to rejig it for the audio version. Yes. Yeah. There were there were a couple of uh, changes that to make that that more um, accessible, but the uh, without reading reference pages and things like that, uh, really, we're probably talking about. Um, I think the whole book was maybe 80, 90 pages to read. Uh, so 
it, it wasn't as long as a 300 page novel uh, that that so maybe that took you a little a little quicker to get through this one but um, I don't remember how long it took because I, I, I you you know I, I work on multiple books all the time and I do a piece and then send it to the author and the author then tells me if anything needs changing or and while they're listening and making sure that's okay I'm working on another one or another one so I I forget how long each one takes because I'm working on multiple books you know at all times um yeah but it was it was a nice book to do to get your story do you want to talk a little bit about your background because you're an yeah, academic so, I mean a big deal yeah I guess so I guess so Yes, I, I'm a I'm a proud teacher. I'm an educator. I uh, I've I, I've taught college now for um, about 16 years. I, I teach college research writing, and so that that's the heart of what we do is get into a subject, any kind of subject, and find data on it and report it. and And I prepare these college students at different levels to uh, to write all of the papers that they're going to write in their college career and. Um, that's uh that's that's what i do for a living during the day i'm also a writer and so this was my uh ninth book uh and i think it's probably about my fourth or fifth nonfiction book at uh, first anything there's nothing else like it in my catalog this is completely uh it was it was based on the personal experience of course but and is this the only one that has the personal experience in it no um I think I, I think writing there's there's always that personal experience in writing uh, that comes through even if it's fiction. Yeah. I think in the in the fiction that I've published, you you I think it's very difficult for an author to uh, to c completely conceal the autobiographical elements. It's it's in there. It's just deep in there. It comes out. Um, it's funny yeah, you should say that because I find that with the fiction books I do, and I have to do the voices of the characters. Uh, the characters are usually based on people I've met at some stage in my life. They're all bosses or girlfriends or whatever. And I did one book. It was 15 hours long, and it was a book about uh, set in Liverpool in England. And my family are all from Liverpool. And it was about policemen and gangsters. And I think there was over 30 characters in it. Every one of them is one of my family. <laughs> you know, really? Yeah, and and one of my teachers at school. <laughs> yeah, oh. they don't know it, but they they are. Yeah, yeah. 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 But they, it's someone else's work. You know, it, it's not. I didn't write it. It's someone else's work. But you still end up. You, a piece of you has to come out, and if you do anything slightly creative, you have to. Uh, you give up a piece of yourself. You do. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of get what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, yeah, we look around. We take our models from, from all other, from people we meet as, as well as uh, the other books we read and other sources. Musicians do it all the time. They, they sample from different uh, influences. So you can't help it, I think. Um, th this was probably the most, um, the, the truest. I mean, the other nonfiction books that I've written kind of started with I have a book um, personality and prejudice and then I have another book learning and, and personality and they were they were based on my academic research my dissertation was uh, in the field of education my doctorates in education so those those initial the initial research for the for that topic came from a personal experience in the classroom with right. students with many right. students so uh, I think it always starts there uh, with a personal element um, that where you're affected by, by this somehow. Um, I think the poetry I've written and published also deeply personal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I have one novel published so far out of the, the several I've written. So that novel also has autobiographical elements. Uh, it's based on my, my childhood, but, uh, and, and I wrote a second book that, that kind of uh, sets that book up and, goes back through the difference between uh, my character and me and so that there is that there is that line there's a difference and um, but it, there's there's definitely it's impossible to get that keep that personal element out yeah and having the bell's palsy you'd think if you were just a writer yeah it's a big deal but not as much as a, 
a big deal as someone who has to stand in front of a class of people. How how did that affect you? Yes. Yeah, so I, and I this was a Monday morning. I woke up with it, and I had to go right in and teach a class. I think uh, at ten o'clock, and uh, here I was, you know, trying to figure out what I, what I had, what what was wrong with my face, and uh, I just kind of stumbled in that day. And I, I can't imagine how the students felt during that class session. I. I cut them loose that day, but uh, they they must have been imagining. I went in, I think I had some wild uh, excuse that I had injured myself and um, the doctors were still trying to figure, because I was still trying to, I, I don't think, I hadn't even been to the doctor at that point. Uh, so it, it, I really scrambled to, to get through that class and uh, I, I'm, it must have looked terrible for for the poor students that had to live through that. But in, in the weeks that followed, I think one of the biggest thing was um, was adjusting my speech, and I really had to go through speech, my own speech therapy, um, because it, it affected my speech uh, so greatly. And so that was a tough thing because as a public speaker, every day I have to get up there in front of a room. And you know, how do you do that? If uh, first of all you have the visual element. But then you have to also uh, be able to speak and, and communicate. And so I was dealing with both of those. Um, and, and, and a lot of Bell's uh, victims will also go to occupational therapy. They'll actually get speech therapy for, for this. So that is one, uh, one element that a doctor may recommend after, after a while if the person hasn't really uh, gotten better. Well, it's William K. Lawrence, who is a successful writer. You've got, you say it's nine books out there. They're all available on Amazon. There's, there's yeah. a novel, there's poetry, there's all sorts of good stuff. And the one that we did together and turned into an audio book is called The Bell's Book, An Essential Guide to Bell's Palsy, How to Take Back Your Smile. And if you would like to get a free copy, uh, if you go down below in the notes in the in the YouTube version, if this is embedded somewhere, see if you can find the the, the pure YouTube version, because then you can get to the blurb. In the blurb there, there are the links to click through. If you go for a three for a, a free thirty day trial of Audible, you can download the book for free right now. And that in the blurb is the thing to click. And uh, William, thank you very much for choosing me to help tell your story. And uh, continued success in spreading the word about this uh, um, very strange and mysterious uh, condition. And I'm sure this book, whether they read it or whether they use the audio book, I'm sure it will help a lot of people. And, uh, and I'm glad I could be part of it. It feels like I'm doing something worthwhile with my life at last. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it does help some people. I thank you for uh, participating in it.